The death of uh, the former minister of police during apartheid, Adrian Flock, has generated a debate on the role he played during his tenure at the helm of the South African police. Flock, who passed away last week, was a part of the apartheid leadership that gave commands uh, to juniors to harass and terrorise those who were opposed to the regime. Veteran uh, editor Anton Harbour describes Flock's involvement in the atrocities that were committed by the then regime in the late 1980s. Some of the worst murders, uh, torture and bombings happened under Flock's watch. So this means he was uh, politically responsible for a lot of uh, the worst horrors of the later era of apartheid. SABC News International editor Sophie McQueen. I spoke to veteran editor and professor at Wits University Centre for Journalism, Anton Harbour. He came from, as I understand it, a fairly simple background and worked his way up in the National Party. He became an MP and then he became a senior MP, then he became a deputy minister. But he was minister of the police during the darkest time of apartheid, when the police changed from being a, just a repressive machinery to a killing machinery um, in the late 1980s, when some of the worst murders some of the worst torture, some of the worst bombings uh, happened under his watch. Um, so he was politically responsible for a lot of the worst horrors of the late era of apartheid. The late era of apartheid, I remember very well, I was in the Val Triangle at that time. And I remember the Val unrests. Hmm. And when we saw that police helicopter, we used to say, there is flock. And indeed, uh, when he has left, then the brutality was unleashed on us. We were still very young. What led to him to be a trusted person to deal with, you know, whoever? was resisting the system. Look, he was a solid, loyal, national party cabinet minister. He did as what was required and what was considered necessary by the apartheid government. Um, he was loyal until he wasn't loyal uh, because he became one of the few ministers to actually repent um, and go to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and then lead a life of charity, interestingly. He devoted his life after that to good deeds, to, to feeding the poor, to housing the poor, in a humble and quiet way. Um, and of course, he famously went to wash the feet of Reverend Fang Chikani um, in the union buildings um, because he was Minister of Police when they attempted to poison Chikani terribly in 1988 or 89. Um, he really oversaw terrible, the, the most repressive time, the time when the police were completely rampant in areas like the Vile Triangle, the East Rand. Um, the police were killing people um, and they were systematically assassinating people. It was the time of Flakplas and uh, lots and lots of murders. And he was the person politically responsible for the police and the security police that were doing most of these deeds. If you were to take us down memory lane, in your observation and your recollection, what are the most atrocious things that happened under his watch historically example of uh, those atrocities um a few things come to mind um the murder of the craddock four a brutal horrible murder of four people who were doing no more than leading resistance and much admired young men um, he gave the order or, the, or he was in the security council that gave the order to deal with them and that was taken to mean kill them and they were killed and burnt in their car 
in a most brutal fashion, and then their funerals were banned, leading to more unrest. It was an escalating unrest and brutality. Another one I would cite would be killings by the Flakplas crew. And you recall the incident where they tricked 10 people into, um, into coming across the border and then brutally shot them in cold blood um, in their vehicle. Um, I would cite the poisoning of Frank Giacani because that is so cruel. Um, they put poison, they opened his suitcase at the airport and put poison in his underwear mm. so that he got very ill while he was in the US um, and very nearly died. Mm. A very significant one was the bombing of Kasatu House. Mm. Um, Kasatu House was an important center where Kasatu was based and Kasatu was of course a pinnacle mm. of the resistance movement in the late 1980s and they couldn't deal with it. Um, they bombed the building so that Kasatu couldn't operate there. They did it at night, um, um, so at least um, um, not too many people were hurt. Um, but it was that kind of illegal, very comp even by their own law, mm -hmm. it was illegal um, activity. And it meant that, that we, we, we lived in a terribly brutal time when activists had to live with the awareness that they could be killed at any time. Either just in a protest because police would open fire or they would systematically hunt people down as they did, for example, with the Craddock Four. So it's, 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 difficult now to recall just how callous and brutal and bloody and ugly it was. Um, and I think now that we live in a democracy, we often forget mm. how tough it was, how risky it was, um, what courage it took for people to resist in that time. Now, one thing that we knew then was that the system was also infiltrating people and using people to commit those atrocities and also certain organizations you'd recall that there were even suspicion then that uh, a organization such as ingata freedom party then was being used to fuel this uh, hostilities and crimes against humanity. In your recollection, uh, there's an incident uh, where you got a tip off when you were a journalist then and an editor then in terms of trying to figure out how this infiltration and the use of other institutions and people and organization was being done in a clandestine. Can you tell us that story? Well, you know, um, I think now you're referring to the, the post-Mandela release, the, the early 1990s, when negotiations had begun, mm. but they were endangered by the violence, by the war in areas like the East Rand and the uh, KZM Midlands. And the Val Triangle. And the um, um, and, but in the Midlands it was, well, actually in a lot of places it was a battle between, the, between what in Carter, now known as the IFP, mm -hmm. and the newly returned from exile ANC and its, and its internal allies. Um, and it was a bloody and brutal war, but we were, over time, I was editor of the Weekly Mail, and we were over time collecting evidence that um, police and the government were taking sides in that battle. They were, mm -hmm. they were feeding that battle. Mm -hmm. They were feeding training and arms and money and encouragement to uh, various parties, including Inkata, 
to provoke the violence and try and weaken the ANC before elections and in the negotiations period. So it was completely critical. Um, uh, we ran, for example, we broke the big story of what became known as the Caprivi 200. When the um, military intelligence recruited 200 in Carter members and took them to the Caprivi strip for training. It was a little bit earlier, but those 200 who had special military training as in Carter members became a key element of the stirring up of violence. Um, and and uh, we certainly viewed it as violence that was intended to weaken the ANC and disrupt the negotiations. Uh, but you know, all our evidence was circumstantial and it was fragmented. Mm. So people were dismissing us, the mainstream media. People were saying, well, if it's true, you have to prove it. Mm. And then one day we got these documents. Um, that came from a former security policeman who had left and left the country and taken them with him. Those documents, when we got them, showed secret police payments to the IFP at a time of negotiations and at a time of this almost civil war. Mm. It was absolutely critical because it was the first documentary evidence that showed um, this alliance between the apartheid state and mm. Inkata and the role the police and the military were playing in mm. stirring up violence and undermining the ANC. So it was very important. We got the documents, we had to verify them, mm -hmm. we did it as best we could um, and then we published them um, and we were terrified because for one thing we were scared that we'd been set up because they used to do that they used to leak false information to set up newspapers they they wanted to get um, um, but we were also scared of the reaction um, so when um, Flock and his spokesperson admitted that the documents were genuine, it was a very, very important breakthrough because it exposed what was going on and um, helped prevent it carrying on. So you were then invited to the then propagandist SABC. <laughs> I, would, I, I really want that story, sure. you know, starting from when you are invited, called off and come back and your so it's a, in studio. Quite certainly, it's very interesting because you have to see it was at a very peculiar time because the SABC was trying to shift from the old propaganda apartheid voice to something independent. But it was still in the hands of, of the conservative old guard. And frankly, it was an old guard that didn't really understand journalism because they had just been propagandists. Mm -hmm. But they were trying. So, so I was invited on the night we were, we were sending the paper to the printer so it would be out the next morning. On that night, I told an SABC producer that we were running the story because it was somebody with whom we had a relationship and it was trying to make change. And they invited me to come. They had a program then called Focus. Focus or Focus, one night English, one night Afrikaans on SABC One. They invited me to come and talk about the story and debate it with the police. Um, it was fascinating because when I got there, I brought a copy of our front page and I showed it to Craig Kotzer, who was the minister's spokesperson and an ex-journalist, interestingly. He took one look. He was completely startled. And he went off, out of the studio, disappeared, and they just left me waiting. Then the producer came back and she, you could tell she was not comfortable. She was, in fact, quite upset. Mm. And she said, I've been overridden. They will, we can't go on with the story. And they threw me out. Mm. So the next day they admitted the story was true. Mm. but. 
and then the papers all picked up the story. The Saturday Star ran a front page telling how they'd kicked me out at the last minute because it told you about the SABC, that there were some people trying to change it, but it, but it was still, still in the hands of the old guard. They didn't know how to do it, frankly. Um, so they said, OK, come back the next day and you, you, you can um, be on with Flock himself, the minister himself. Now, that in itself was unusual because members of the alternative press did not get to be on SABC mm. with ministers. Mm. So we said, excellent. And they were going to pre-record it on Sunday morning. So, you know, you know, as a television person, interviews are as much performance yes, yes. as anything else. Very colorful. So, you know, the papers we had, it was only a few sheets of paper. But what gave us power was they didn't know what else we had. We had published and we said we're going to publish more. Mm -hmm. And so they, were, they didn't know what we had. And the lawyer said, I must take the papers in case I need to prove something. But I didn't want them to see we only had a few pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So I took our whole legal file for the year and we were involved in many court cases. So it was this thick. Mm -hmm. And I put some papers in the bottom, in the top and in the middle. I put it under my arm and I, and we got to SABC. I said, just wait, let's go a few, let's, let's make sure they're there first. We waited till like five past. We went up and Flock was already sitting at the desk waiting for this uh, recording. So I walked across the room and I took this file and I went bang on the table. <laughs> the table shook and uh, he went pale. Because he thought, oh my gosh, what have they got? Lots of information. Exactly. And I knew I had him, you see. Mm. Then what had happened is, is I was with the lawyer, my lawyer, who I mm. took just in case. And we'd agreed in the car we're going to make preconditions. Mm. And we said, we know these are unreasonable preconditions, but we're going to push our luck. Mm. So I then said to the producer, okay, I said, we'll do this interview, but it must be in English. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that would give me the language advantage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It must not be edited. Mm -hmm. It must be recorded as live. Mm -hmm. And um, I, could, I was going to ask the minister questions directly because yes. I knew there was a presenter. Mm -hmm. She would try and ask him nice questions, ask mm -hmm. me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She would soften it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to have that because I knew I had him. <laughs> um, when it started, the SABC, she was a traditional SABC interviewer of that period. She was asking him the softest, most gentle questions, inviting him to justify himself and justify what he'd done. And I sat and I listened and eventually I thought, enough. And I leant across her. I kind of brushed her aside and I started throwing questions at him. You know, why was the secret? What else, who else did you give money to? What other things did you finance? Did you also give arms? Um, and he was flustered because he wasn't used to getting this treatment at the SABC. Anyway, it, we were scheduled for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, the... Uh, the, in fact, the editor-in-chief, the producer the was an editor-in-chief, <laughs> was standing there and he was saying, okay, wrap it up, wrap it up, time. And I thought, no, 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 I'm not finished. I just ignored him. Mm. And I knew they couldn't cut it. Mm. So I just carried on with my questions for another 12 minutes. Mm. In the end, he was saying, stop, stop. And, I, and then I said, I have one more question. Mr. Minister, if I show that you have lied will you resign and he was you know he'd never been talked to like this before he said uh, he said well well um if it's shown that i acted improperly i will resign thank you end of the interview mm -hmm. four day, few days later he was no longer minister of police when you look back mm. he then there was a truth and reconciliation yes. commission 
where those who were giving commands and who participated in this in these evil deeds yes had to go and tell the truth and nothing else but the truth in terms of their involvement did he go and did he really uh, divulge everything you know so my understanding is that he he did go um, and he was one of the very few of the central perpetrators, the, the leaders who went. And he spoke about, about many of the things that, that he was responsible for, but not all. And he didn't apologize. Um, he didn't speak about some things. And he said he was not personally responsible. I never told them to kill anyone, he said, for example. I never told them to bomb Kasato House. I just told them to deal with it. And what is to do? Well, it's clear what he meant and what everyone understood him saying. When they said, deal with the Craddock Four, mm. it's clear what was meant. But he was saying that he didn't mean kill them, but it, but it was not believable. He got amnesty for certain things. He was later charged for the poisoning of Chikani. He did later, and he got a suspended sentence. I'm amazed he got a suspended sentence. I guess it tells you about the, the mood at the time. He later apologized um, and repented to a much greater extent. And uh, he dedicated himself to this life of charity in his repentance. So he did repent more than most. He did ne he never told the full story. He never he 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 protected others. Um but he did go further than any other cabinet minister. One condition uh, in terms of the TRC uh, act and processes was full disclosure or to receive an amnesty. Yes. And also to completely apologize. He didn't do those two issues. Do you think he got away with murder by not facing prosecution? As we know now that uh, the members of the family of the Craddock Four are still asking questions and demanding accountability. No, there's no question he got away with murder. There's no question many people from that period got away with murder. In the spirit of reconciliation and because it was considered necessary to end the war and the civil war. But if you ask me, the roots of our current issues over the rule of law, the root of our current problems with people's attitude towards the law lies in the fact that murderers walked free. Look, I say, I say that he did repent and apologize more than others. Um, so I wouldn't point to him in particular. But, you know, when people today um, see law tracking down people who are corrupt um, or people who, um, or, or, or murderers today, we can't forget that there were murderers who got away, that the justice system allowed that to happen. And even after the TRC did not pursue all these cases, they pursued a couple, but many, many murderers got away with it. And I think that's the roots of our problem with the rule of law now. The issue of reparation is another thorny issue in terms of that process and to date people are still saying uh, the new government 
the democratic government didn't do the right thing in terms of reparation as proposed by the TRC Act and processes. Why this government, the democratic government, even though you had different leaders at different times, why was this government or is still reluctant to finish the process of reparation? Is it issues related to resources? As a veteran journalist, what's your view? You know, it's bewildering. You ask a difficult question um, because the TRC recommended reparations. Uh, money was put aside. Uh, some of it was given out, um, but some of it has never been given out. Now, I understand it is complex because you have many, many people who claim. I mean, there were many, many victims of apartheid, so many people have claims. And um, sorting those out, the real ones from the not so real ones, the serious from the less serious, terribly difficult. That I understand, but I can't understand why there's so little commitment to try and put this behind us. Why we allow so many people to be embittered by the fact that they were promised reparations and they didn't get them. These scars, these scars are, are deep in our society now, all of these scars. Um, and so when we have violence now, when we see so much everyday violence, I think the, the root of it lies in those scars of a failure to heal those deep, deep wounds of apartheid. We see um, some incidents of racism beginning to emerge. When you even look internationally, the right wing movements, I mean, when you look at what happened in Brazil on Sunday, you know, the January 6 in the United States of America, and particularly the America one, there were some people from South Africa. Do you think we'll be able to address issues of racial discrimination, not only as a country, but around the world, but particularly for South Africa? How do we deal with this? Because my fear is that it will blow up. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, um, you're asking me very difficult questions. There's just, the, you know, the, 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 the thing about apartheid is people often say apartheid failed and that's why we moved to democracy. But apartheid succeeded in creating division and inequality, divisions in power, in economic power, in education, in, 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 in every part of our society. And I think we always knew that we couldn't heal those quickly. It would take at least a generation and maybe longer because, um, because the, the, these, these structures, these structural inequalities and structural racism runs deep. Um, but we certainly thought that 28 years after democracy, we would have made more progress. I mean, almost 30 years next year. Correct. We certainly thought there would be more progress. It's, it's deeply, deeply concerning because you can see the roots of further conflict. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's a global issue. Um, the state of the uncertainty of the world, um, the uncertainty of the world's economy, the serious inequality across the world, both global inequality and inequality in countries, countries like America, countries like China, the big powers, um, are getting worse. And that means instability, it means conflict, um, and it, it means these things are increasingly difficult to deal with. And finally, as a nation right now, what can we learn from 
the flock experience. In terms of all of us, you touch on what was the role of the SABC then, what was the role of other parties or organizations, the role of the state then, yes, and the role of activists then. So I would say a couple of things. The first thing I think is the importance of the rule of law and of having a working justice system that treats everyone equally. Um, the reason people like Flock got away with it was because the rule of law was breached. Um, in a democracy, we have tried to reassert the rule of law in a different way under apartheid, in a, in a fair and just mm -hmm. and constitutional way. But we see flaws in our justice system and we see sometimes a breakdown of the rule of law. And I think this is if this is would be the most important thing to address um, that everyone should be treated equally before the law mm -hmm. and that the law should be implemented properly mm -hmm. and fully as well as fairly and justly um, for the SABC it really heightens the need for for independence um, independence from all of those who would uh, try and improperly influence the public broadcaster. Of course, everyone tries to influence the public broadcaster and that's fine. That's part of the political process. But the independence of the broadcaster to make its own journalistic and news decisions is absolutely critical. Uh, democracy depends on it. Rule of law depends on it. And SABC's survival depends on it. And we've seen over the years, it's a constant field of struggle. It's a constant tug of war between those who would pull it closer to one way um, and those who would prefer it to be pull it another way and, and, and at least some people in the SABC trying to maintain the independence. And it will always be a place where that battle happens. But I think we need to reinforce the importance of the independence of the SABC and institutions like it.